Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the November Florida Health Grand Rounds. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Please remember your lines are muted. However, we do encourage questions. Simply type them in to the chat box or the question box. I will monitor, monitor them throughout the presentation, and we will have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Um, additionally, today's Grand Rounds does count for continuing education credits. Those are only nursing credits, they're not medical credits. To receive them, simply complete the survey at the end of the presentation. It will automatically pop up. However, if it's blocked by your filters, it will also be included in the follow-up email. There's no need to do both. If for whatever reason you don't gain access to either copy of the survey, simply email me, Edda Rodriguez, and I will send it to you. I'll go ahead and chat out my email as well so that you guys can write it down. Um, and then I'm uh, going to have a brief intro today, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Lowenstein. Dr. David Lowenstein is a board-certified neuropsychologist, the director for the Center of Cognitive Neuroscience and Aging, and a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Lowenstein is considered a leading thought leader in the field of neuropsychology and its interface with brain biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. He has been at the forefront of the development of no novel cognitive and functional assessment measures that are used nationally and internationally, as well as groundbreaking work relating to cognitive neurosciences to brain bio biomarkers such as amyloid PET, MRI imaging, and other imaging modalities. He has over 200 peer review papers and book chapters and has been continuously funded by the National Institutes of Health. His work has also been supported by Ed and Ethel Moore grants from the Florida Department of Health. He plays a major role in the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We're very excited to have Dr. Lowenstein here today to present on his work, as well as to shed um, light on November, which is the National Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Thank you, Edda, and good morning to everyone. I'd like to talk to you about cognitive stress paradigms, biomarkers, and detection of early Alzheimer's disease. Um, and before I begin, I just want to um, say that much of our work has been supported by the State of Florida Ed and Ethel Moore Alzheimer's Disease Research Program carried out by the Florida Department of Health. Um, both uh, Dr. Rosie Curiel and myself have several grants from the um, Florida Department of Health, and, it has, and this seed money and the pilot funding has led to a number of um, federally funded um, R01s from the federal government, National Institutes of Health. So we, I'm very grateful for the Florida Department of Health for helping us get the best research to, researchers together in Florida and to help um, fund these national initiatives to make Florida um, one of the leaders in Alzheimer's disease research nationally. Well, I want to talk to you first about early detection of abnormal memory process. By the time a person has been diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type, significant deterioration has already occurred in the brain. So detection of the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease is important because it can enable innovative new therapies that can be initiated before significant brain degeneration has occurred. And I'd like you to think about cancer 20, 25 years ago. Um, in the early um, days of cancer research, there were very few cures or treatments for cancer. And what people in the cancer field did was basically they decided to focus on the earliest pathological changes of cancer, even in the preclinical stage. And by getting to the pathogenesis, the earliest uh, markers of cancer, they were able to develop therapies, not only for prevention, but to um, treat stage one, stage two cancers. And, and that technology has evolved to effectively treat even um, stage four, 
and uh, stage three cancers. So early detection of, of memory problems is very, very important. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease. There's two abnormal things that occur within the brain of people with early Alzheimer's disease. These things probably occur um, 20 years or more before the overt manifestation of um, disease. And one are, this is microscopic. These are senile plaques, okay, caused by abnormal aggregation of amyloid, you can see here, and neurofibrillary tangles. Um, the tangles um, basically can be seen right here on the stain. So the presence of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles um, are the hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease. And that's why Alzheimer's disease can only be definitively uh, diagnosed um, at autopsy, although our clinical tools, which I will show you, uh, means that we're very, very good at diagnosing the disease um, during life. So here's an MRI for those of you out there who like MRIs, who have seen MRIs, this is called the coronal slice. And you can see this is the medial temporal lobes, and this is somebody who is young. And this is looking at the hippocampus and orinal cortex. This is where short-term memories are, are um, formed. As you can see, as you get older, do you see how the space starts um, opening up and as tissue um, begins to be lost? By the time you have mild cognitive impairment, look, look what's happening here. You can just see um, tremendous changes. And then, of course, here is somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So even with one MRI scan at the coronal slice by the mammillary bodies, we can very easily see neurodegenerative changes that are caused by illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, but in the last um, 10 or so years, we have advanced quite a bit. Now we're able to actually image amyloid accumulating in the brain while a person is alive. So, for example, here is a cognitively normal person, okay? Um, and this person um, basically... Um, the red areas signify where there is amyloid buildup. You can see very little red in a cognitively normal person. And this is somebody who has mild cognitive impairment, but doesn't seem to have um, amyloid buildup. So the amnestic mild cognitive impairment is being caused by something other than amyloid load. So we know this is most likely non-Alzheimer's disease pathology. Now I want you to look here um, at this slide with somebody who has mild Alzheimer's disease and um, is um, amyloid positive on PET scan. PET means positron emission tomography. Um, and you can see um, amyloid ligands, you can see them in the frontal lobes, you can see them in the parietal, precuneus, and the temporal regions. And even somebody with mild cognitive impairment, that means they have memory impairment or other cognitive impairment, but it's not enough to meet criteria for dementia or mild neurocognitive disorder. We call this MCI because a person generally is pretty independent of activities of daily living. You can see this pathology in the brain. And we can see this pathology in the brain 20 or more years before what is called the Alzheimer's cascade before um, the brain starts really deteriorating to the point that it starts losing neurons. This is a process that happens very early on in the disease. This is tau imaging. Tau imaging is, is actually our ability to in vivo look at phosphorylated tau in the brain. We're very pleased at the University of Miami um, we were awarded the first grant from the Florida Department of Health, and we are the first center in Florida to actually be doing tau imaging. So in addition to uh, imaging people with amyloid, we are actually looking at tau in the brain because tau deposits seem to be more correlated 
with um, cognitive function. So you can see here that um, you hear, this is a young person, and you can see here, by the time somebody has Alzheimer's disease, this is where there's tau buildup. And it's interesting because the tau buildup is more in the medial temporal lobes, entorhinal cortex, hippocampus, um, and it's not the same distribution of amyloid. So these two things are going on, but they distribute in different places of the brain. We also have cerebral spinal fluid markers. We do this work at the University of Miami. Many of our um, participants will get uh, a certain um, uh, very much like if you got an epidural, they'll get, they'll get CSS drawn, and we can actually look at total tau, phosphorylated tau, and A beta um, in the cerebral spinal fluid, and those are also very accurate indicators of Alzheimer's disease. What's very exciting is many investigators at the One Florida ADRC, um, One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we're actually um, looking at blood biomarkers. So that's much less invasive, and we're hopeful um, that we can actually look at brain biomarkers in the blood rather than the cerebral spinal fluid. And, and certainly that's much easier to draw blood than to draw cerebral spinal fluid. So with all of these wonderful, wonderful advances in the early detection of Alzheimer's disease, we have some limitations. And it's very important that we know what these limitations are. First of all, these are very expensive. So to get a PET scan or to get a TAL scan could be anywhere from, um, from um, $2,500 to $4,000. So usually most people do not have access to these scans unless you're in an academic medical center. Number two, they're not readily available anywhere except an academic medical center. So our job is to serve everybody and to provide tools that everybody can use in every clinical setting, uh, not just academic medical centers. The third thing is the Food and Drug Administration, um, although they're, they're very, very mindful of therapies that will reduce amyloid and tau, they really care more about whether it affects cognitive and functional endpoints. So for example, if we had an agent that removes some amyloid from the brain, but it doesn't do anything to help the person's cognition or to prevent cognitive decline or functional decline, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't really care because the Food and Drug Administration really wants this to have a significant impact on a person's quality of life their cognitive and their functional status. So these pretty scans, but in and of themselves, do not translate into the real world problems that people who have Alzheimer's disease or people who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease face. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there may be a 10 to 20 year window between amyloid deposition and clinical symptoms. And so some people with significant amyloid load will not exhibit clinical symptoms during their life. So people may have this amyloid in the brain when they're in their 70s, right? And by the time they're 90, they may still have amyloid in the brain, but no cognitive symptoms. And in fact, of, of people who go to autopsy 85 plus years of age, uh, 25 or more percent of those people have Alzheimer's disease pathology. So our lab, in addition to figuring out why people succumb to disease, we also are very interested in those resilience factors that keep people who have brain disease brewing and yet they're able to stave off the clinical symptoms. So that's just as important to find out why people do well in the face of brain disease. So that's an important part of what we do. Now, I want to talk about neuropsychological measures of, of that shorthand, um, fancy way of saying cognitive measures, measures of memory, reasoning, language, problem-solving abilities, spatial skills, and neuropsychologists usually give tests to people who are concerned about their memory or, or at risk for Alzheimer's or other diseases. 
And um, the problem with neuropsychological measures is the vast majority of tests given in clinics across Florida and across the United States are based on cognitive paradigms that are six or seven decades old. So for example, there's a test called the Trails V test that is very, very well used by neuropsychologists. That was actually invented in World War I during the Army Alpha battery movement. Uh, Wexler and Stone's Wexler Memory Scale was uh, created in 1945. Um, Ray's a learning test was developed in the 1950s. And all the tests that we have are just updates. The paradigms haven't changed. We just use the same tests with different norms, and we think we're presenting something new. So there's a concern that with all of the progress that have been made in biomarkers and in understanding the brain, um, we're not using current measures that could capture the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. So the question is, can we develop cognitive stress paradigms analogous to exercise EKGs? So you may ask, what is a cognitive stress paradigm? Well, imagine you go into a doctor's office and getting an EEG of the heart. And when the, when the doctor puts the EEG electrodes on you, unless you have major, major problems with your heart, arrhythmias, things like that, the EEG is going to be normal. And many of you, if you haven't had one yourself, know people who have a cognitive stress test. What's a cognitive stress, excuse me, a exercise EKG, which is an exercise stress test. And what's so important about an exercise stress test, you get on the treadmill, you're injected with thallium or another agent, and you try to work the heart to maximum capacity. And that is why people get exercise EKGs in medicine, because sometimes when you don't stress the heart, it doesn't bring out the underlying deficits. So using that same analogy, neuropsychological tests are done in a quiet setting with no distractions, allowing the person to use every advantage they can. And they're very much like an extra regular EKG. They don't stress the cognitive system. So at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, our colleagues um, and our national and international partners have developed tests that are analogous to exercise EKGs. We really want to push the cognitive system. For example, people with brain injury, I've had patients who've had head trauma, and they they score pretty well on neuropsychological tests. But what happens when they have to go back to their job as a receptionist and recept in a physician's office, and all of a sudden they have the doctor um, in their ear saying, I want you to make sure you type this prescription out, and you have somebody um, at the front window, and you have a phone ringing. This person may fall apart because of the brain injury. They may not be able to multitask. And even though the tests showed them as scoring within normal limits, once you put a challenge on the brain and the cognitive system, things break down. So I hope that gives you a reader's guide that just condensed version of everything you need to know about cognitive stress tests. So here's a cognitive stress test. This is our little brain on an exercise bike to help you remember. Uh, cognitive stress tests are designed to challenge the cognitive system and have proven to be able to identify subtle memory deficits among pre-symptomatic individuals that are not detected by traditional memory measures. And so now we're going to talk to you about the Lowenstein Acevedo scales for semantic interference and learning called the Lassie stress test. And to make it easy to remember, uh, many of you are familiar with Lassie, the iconic dog that saved Timmy, and he was a big hero of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, um, this scale is very unique because unlike other memory tests, we basically tell the person, the older adult, what categories we're using. We don't want them to use their own strategies, so we actually give them the categories. We say there's, there's going to be 15 words, 
They're either going to be in the categories of animals, fruits, or musical instruments. So we give them category cues as acquisition before they learn. Once they learn this list, we actually then tell, ask them, okay, how many, what animals do you remember? What fruits do you remember? What musical instruments do you remember? This is called cued recall. So you see what we're doing? We're helping people learn at acquisition. We're giving them the uh, acquisition cues, and we're using the same cues to retreat. So over two trials, most older adults can get between 10 and 15 of these pretty easily. That's not what makes this a cognitive stress test. What makes it a cognitive stress test is we present a second list of semantically related targets, twice with cued recall. So there are 15 different words, but they all belong to the same semantic categories, animals, fruits, and musical instruments. And so what happens is when you force a person to adopt a semantic cue and you present a second list, a phenomenon happens. And that's called proactive semantic interference. That means that the old learning interferes with the new semantic learning. And then when you give the person another try to learn the list, if they're not able to get back to where they were with the first list, that's called failure to recover from proactive interference. So proactive interference and recovery from proactive interference actually tend to be very important features of the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show you some data. And this is not assessed by any other cognitive measures that are out there in Florida, nationally or internationally, and we'll show you some data comparing it to some other tests. Um, for those of you who like graphic um, representations, here's your 15 target words, fruits, clothing, musical instruments, Cued recall of um, list A target. We present the targets again. We have cued recall. We present the list B. We have cued recall of list B. And then we present the B targets again. And we have cued recall of the list B targets. So that's what we're looking for. Retroactive interference is just a phenomenon where we go back to the first list and see how the new learning affects the original learning, okay? So this is called a cognitive stress paradigm. So um, we've, we've published a nice review for anybody interested. Uh, rather than show you slides and slides of data, I'm just going to summarize. The LASI distinguishes between people who have amnestic MPI, people who are deemed not normal, but not enough to meet criteria for mild cognitive impairment, in cognitively normal participants. And study after study, we can differentiate these people who have the subtlest form of cognitive impairment. For people with amnestic MTI, mild cognitive impairment, the failure to recover from proactive interference is associated with decreased volume on MRI regions that are seen impaired in Alzheimer's disease. And what's very interesting, number three, it's among people who are normal. They're neuropsychologically normal. They're living in the community. There's nothing wrong. And yet, failure to recover from proactive interference in the LASI is very highly associated with amyloid being deposited in their brains in Alzheimer's prone regions, in the percunius, in the posterior cingulate, in different uh, parts of the brain that are associated with amyloid deposition. So actually among people who look normal, they're living in the community, they're doing fine, problems on the LASI can actually distinguish among normal elders who have these amyloid deposits in the brain. And that is um, pretty amazing. So this just gives you, um, these are 23 people living in the community without uh, neuropsychological impairment, can you see the total amyloid of the brain, the correlation is 0 0.60. That's a very high brain behavior correlation, okay? Um, um, it's negative because it means 
that that the uh, worse you do on this test, the higher the brain amyloid load is. Okay, and you can see in the anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, precuneus, frontal regions. Interestingly enough. Delayed passages, memory passages, which are used by most neuropsychologists, did not show any relationship between the amyloid load. So that gave us a, cute, a clue that the, uh, the cognitive stress test may be of some value. And this is interesting because Matias Gayou in Madrid, so we had a group in Madrid try to replicate this, and they actually, um, the the FCSRT, it's the Freed and Cued Selective Reminding Test. That is the gold standard used in Europe for Alzheimer's disease detection and trials. And uh, if you look at ROC, that's um, area under the ROC curve, you see with the last we get 0.894. With the European um, test, we get 0.708. And as you can see, uh, as you can see, the LASI is much superior, you can see in blue, much superior uh, to uh, the European test. So for those of you who like graphic representations internationally, um, this was run by another group in Madrid, Spain. Now, you would think that proactive semantic interference, which we, we call PSI, that's also a term if you actually put air in your tires, it's called PSI. But for our purposes, PSI is proactive semantic interference. FRPSI is recovery from proactive interference. It's not limited to cued recall alone. We have found that when a person has to recall that second list, many of them make intrusion errors from the first list or category intrusion errors. So when they have to recall the 15 items from the three categories from list B, guess what happens? What happens is that they start intruding ob uh, words that were in the first list. So these are called intrusion errors. And um, Torres et al. 2019 found that semantic intrusions were associated with amyloid load in the brain and a community-based sample on the LASI test. And of course, uh, uh, proactive semantic interference and retroactive interference, failure to recover from um, retroactive interference were culprits. Now, I want to turn your attention to this very nice study that actually was highlighted on the National Institute on Aging website. And when you get, you get funded by the NIH and you do a study, and they actually, this was published in the journal Neurology, um, it, it, when, they, when they publish it on the website, that's a good sign because that means they're kind of happy with the work that, that you're doing. So uh, on the National Institute of Aging website, uh, there was a headline, Featured Research Cognitive Stress Test Predicts High Levels of Beta Amyloid. So I want to show you that data very quickly without getting into the ins and outs of the paper. So we had three groups. Um, uh, 34 people had mild cognitive impairment that a neurologist was sure was associated with decline for Alzheimer's disease. They had hippocampal atrophy, they had gradual progression, everything pointed to Alzheimer's disease. But to make sure, we gave them an amyloid PET scan and they were all amyloid positive. So that was very good. So we knew these are people who, are, who have mild cognitive impairment they're not demented, they don't have a major neurocognitive disorder, but these are under people with underlying Alzheimer's pathology. Now, we had another group that the neurologist could swear that they had Alzheimer's disease clinically. They had the history, they had the hippocampal atrophy, they had the course. Guess what? They were amyloid negative. There was no amyloid in the brain. So guess what these people are called? They're called SNAP. Suspected non-Alzheimer's pathology. They look like Alzheimer's disease. They clinically seem like they have Alzheimer's disease. But if you don't have amyloid in the brain, you can't have Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So we call these SNAP. Okay? And then we took another group that we knew had other um, etiologies 
um, cerebrovascular disease, disease, diffuse Lewy body disease, FPD, um, that is not um, the florist, it's frontal temporal dementia, CTE, cr uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, depression, all comers, we took in a group that we died, and fortunately for us, all of these were amyloid negative, which means at least they were in Alzheimer's disease. So you have one group that you know is Alzheimer's disease who has mild cognitive impairment. You have another group that looks like they have Alzheimer's disease, but they don't have Alzheimer's disease because there's no amyloid load in their brain. We have another group that we know have other conditions and they're amyloid negative. So this is a great way of looking at how the lab performs. And I just want you to focus on red, where the arrow is. You can see the people who had amyloid positive, right, with mild cognitive impairment. You can see they had m many more intrusion errors on the, on the proactive semantic interference tri trial, QB1, than people who had SNAP or people who had non-Alzheimer's who were amyloid negative. You can also see here on B2 semantic intrusions. That's the failure to recover from semantic interference. Many more intrusions were made by people who had high amyloid than people who were amyloid negative and looked like Alzheimer's disease or people who had non-amyloid pathology. And P is less than 0.001 means the chances that this occurred by chance is less than one in a thousand statistically. So we're pretty confident in the results. The other thing for any of you who are neuropsychologists in the audience or people who work with neuropsychologists, things like the Hopkins Verbal Learning Test, Category Fluency, Trails B Time, all the things that neuropsychologists around Florida and around the nation use did not show any differences between the groups. It was only the intrusion errors. So that was pretty interesting and intriguing, and that was published in 2018 in, in Neurology. And this just shows um, we were there, we were able to, to really distinguish the amyloid positive people who uh, had Alzheimer's disease from people who had diseases of other etiologies. You can see this part of the curve is it, it, it's chance. You see how far above the curve we are? This is plotting sensitivity versus specificity. So some people ask, well, did, were there differences on the MRI? You know, did they have volumetric reductions that may have accounted for this? Did not change the results at all. MRI findings did not change findings whatsoever. So we partnered with our friends in Buenos Aires at the Fleming Institute. And this led to a study right now being funded by the Florida Department of Health, where we're actually looking at children of, of parents who have late onset Alzheimer's disease, but the children are asymptomatic. It's just one or more parents had late onset Alzheimer's disease. And so we're doing that in Miami now, thanks to the Florida Department of Health. But I want to show you the study that actually led to us getting interested in this. We had um, Sanchez et al. in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease had 21 clinically asymptomatic middle-aged offspring of late-onset Alzheimer's patients in Argentina. Okay. You can see we're going to Madrid, we're going to Argentina, we're going to Miami, we go, go all over. Uh, and so these 21 people who had one or more parents with Alzheimer's disease were compared to 20 middle-aged controls. And what was interesting is none of the middle-aged controls had intrusions on the LASI, okay? But guess what? 50% of children of adults with late onset Alzheimer's disease had intrusion errors. Wow, 50% versus zero. And these people weren't even asymptomatic. So that got us very curious. And so what we did is with Salvador Guinjone and his group, they ran fMRIs, functional magnetic uh, resident imaging. And all I can tell you is for people who were children of um, a person who had late onset Alzheimer's disease, uh, total intrusions, again, we're telling you intrusions are very important, were related to widespread problems with the connectivity network of the brain involving the hippocampus, insular cortex, 
posterior cingulate, dorsolateral frontal, anterior thalamus, and precuneus. So what does it say? Among people who are 30 to 59, who are asymptomatic, who have a parent with Alzheimer's disease, the LASI showed tremendous correlations, the intrusions with widespread functional disconnectivity of the brain. Once again, showing using another modality that this may be a sensitive marker. And you can just see, uh, this is a statistical seed map for any of you who are interested in fMRI CD maps. Okay. So my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Rosie Curiel, who's actually off to Spain to give a lecture in Seville, a plenary, um, has done a lot of work with Hispanic and non-Hispanic groups, not only in Miami, but with our colleagues in Argentina and Madrid. And all of this table should tell you is that Spanish speakers and English speakers um, do very similarly on the LASI. Okay, the LASI is validated for, for multiple Spanish and English speaking groups. Um, and also, Dr. Curiel in a published paper um, actually showed that uh, correlations with the LASI um, which were correlated with um, problems uh, with reductions in the hippocampus, precuneus, supermarginal, superior temporal, and inferior lateral ventricle. The, the correlations were a little stronger with non Hispanic, but Hispanics had um, even higher correlations in the medial temporal lobe regions. So, once again, this seems to be a culturally fair test that um, when given in Spanish. Now, we wanted to look at other groups because um, South Florida is a very diverse multicultural city. So basically what we did is we were able to evaluate 21 African-American people with an ethnic MCI versus 27 African-American controls. So the 27 African-American controls were totally normal. Their informants said they were normal, the neuropsychological tests using culture fair measures were fine. And then another group, 21, had a domestic MCI. And using, right, the percentage of intrusion errors on QB1, again, intrusion errors, the percentage of errors um, um, as, as a function of the total responses on QB1, the percentage of errors, we call pi, a percentage of intrusion errors, pi. Uh, we could see, that 85.7% of African American people with an ethnic MCI could be correctly identified, and 81.5% of normal controls could be correctly identified. And this area under the ROC curve is very good. And for those of you who have not looked at ROC curves in medicine, this is very, very good. So it looks like the LASI also uh, uh, works for African-American individuals. And we just received word yesterday that this was accepted for publication in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the work my colleague, Dr. Curiel, is doing. We're moving into the digital age, and she's working with computer science at the University of Miami to have a brief computerized LASI that doesn't require an examiner. So they use Google voice recognition. The test automatically administers itself. It can be given over the internet, and we're working on the validation studies now. What is the importance of doing that? Well, you might be at a clinic that doesn't have a trained psychometrist, so now you can actually give this web-based. It promotes efficiency. It provides real-time data entry. We're always testing the voice algorithm uh, to make sure we're improving. Uh, those of you who have um, Echo or Alexa can probably attest to the fact that as it gets to know you, um, it understands you better. And uh, this initiative uh, was originally sponsored by the state of Florida Ed and Ethel Moore grant and led to a $3.6 million grant um, uh, from uh, Dr. Um, Curio L as the principal investigator. So once again, return on investment. 
Um, we now are, are looking at this with a federally funded grant, and we're looking at the brief computerized LASI versus all of the standard tests given in clinical trials and in the Alzheimer's field, the NIH toolbox, uh, to, to put them head to head um, to the, with the LASI. So what are the implications of cognitive stress tests such as the LASI? Well, association with biomarkers make these measures extremely good tools for screening into clinical trials. One of the big problems with clinical trials with Alzheimer's disease agents, as new agents are coming online, is we recruit people without Alzheimer's disease into these trials. And then by the time we work them up and we give them the scans, we determine they don't have Alzheimer's disease. So using intrusion errors may be a very good way of screening people for clinical trials, and it would save the government and farm a lot of money. Number two, it looks like the LASI works very well in different ethnic and cultural groups. And people who, are, who have um, doctorates, um, multiple doctorates, don't do much better than anybody who has graduated from high school because we already give the cues. So they can't rely on some um, individual learning strategy. We give them the strategy, and therefore, it's harder for them to use cognitive reserve to beat the test. Uh, so in, a, in, a, in essence, supplying category cues at both acquisition and retrieval minimizes the effects of individual learning so that the person actually serves as their own control. You can see how they learn. You can see what happens when they have to learn competing information. And you can compare one's performance to their other components of performance, which is a very nice feature. And again, what we're going to have to do if we're doing genetic studies, if we're doing neuroimaging studies, it all falls into endophenotypes. We have to look at how biology actually maps onto cognition and where a world function. And we're working uh, very closely with our genetics people here. We're doing GWASU. We're actually trying to look at whether there's different phenotypes, um, uh, um, cognitive phenotypes, that will help us understand the underlying genetics and the underlying biomarkers. So what are our future directions? We obviously are going to try to refine these cognitive endophenotypes um, of preclinical AD. We basically have many tools that I haven't spoken of that are cognitive stress tests. I just highlighted the last one because we have the most data on it, and I knew this was a very data-driven presentation. Um, we are increasing and refining our biomarker studies looking at cognitive stress tests that are extensions of the LAFIEL, uh, working with computer science and working with virtual um, reality and, and people who even do para-robotics. We're working with trying to get these things um, in the digital age. But being in the digital age doesn't mean giving a test from 40, 50, 60 years ago and putting it on the, on the computer. It means putting things that represent new paradigms on a computer. Very, very important. Because many people put old tests on computers and just say, wow, welcome to the 21st century. Uh, no kidding, that's what they do. And of course, we have partnerships with other academic institutions across the globe, uh, both in the United States and outside of the United States, to validate our measures in other cultures and with other clinical populations. I want to thank you. This is our at least part of our team, the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and Aging Team at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And we also want to thank our collaborators, um, um, the Florida Department of Health, the National Institute on Aging, uh, many academic centers in Florida, um, the Fleming Institute in Buenos Aires, uh, um, the University of Madrid, and many people, it takes many people to uh, build a village and to try to increase understanding, and this could not be done. And finally, I want to thank our participants because older adults who have very busy lives, have a lot of doctor's appointments, who have a lot of things going, take the time, even people who don't have a history of memory problems, to help us understand normal aging, abnormal aging, and to develop tools that we hope will be helpful in the future. Thank you. So we have um, a series of questions.
So the first question we have, if there are patients or people with amyloid deposits and never show symptoms, should we continue to blame these deposits as a possible pathopsychological factor explaining Alzheimer's disease? That's an excellent question. So basically, if there are a minority of people who come to autopsy and they basically have amyloid in their brain and yet they don't exhibit signs of disease, but they have the pathological harm marks of Alzheimer's disease, do we blame amyloid for disease? Well, the answer to that is we know that amyloid is the first, first thing that we can see occurring, even before the uh, deposition of cat. What happens is with, with um, Alzheimer's disease, amyloid by itself is not enough. What happens is that after 10 or 15 years of amyloid and tau deposition, something happens called the Alzheimer's cascade. And we think a series of events happen, microglial activation, oxidative stress, other cofactors that turn on this underlying pathology and make it deadly and have it start killing brain cells. So the question is such a great one because the question is, why do some people have this brain pathology, but they don't have symptoms? And what it shows is, is there's something in the brain protecting them against the Alzheimer's cascade. And so it shows the importance of not only discovering what pathology is, but also understanding what activates pathology and what keeps people healthy. So I would not say this shows that it's not related to Alzheimer's disease, it is. The problem with anti-amyloid therapies is we're going towards one target. In HIV, for example, we have multiple targets, okay? We don't go for one target. So I think one of the failures of the amyloid therapies have been by the time amyloid is accumulated in the brain, a lot of other stuff has occurred as well. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. The next one, um, Two parts, so the first part is, is 25 years old too early for Alzheimer's? And then the second part is, what is the earliest age for a person with uh, brain trauma to get Alzheimer's? Okay, well, remember brain trauma uh, may be a risk factor for um, Alzheimer's disease, but there are many people who have brain trauma who will never get Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things, you know, being a risk factor that increases your percentage of um, several percentage points is much different. So uh, I've had head trauma. Many people have had head trauma. They will never get Alzheimer's disease. So that's number one. Number two, uh, basically, uh, you will not get Alzheimer's disease in your 20s or 30s unless you have probably a presenilin mutation. So there's families in South America that are being studied by La Pera and other people who Alzheimer's has run through generations and generations. These are autosomal dominant cases. These are very, very, very rare. I did see in my 34 year career, I have seen somebody with Alzheimer's disease in their late 30s, it's extremely, extremely rare. Alzheimer's is a disease of aging, and the highest prevalence is in your late 70s and 80s. So you can get it in your 60s. If you get it in the 50s, it's very, very early. And oftentimes, it can be other things like frontal temporal um, um, degeneration. So very rare to have um, any Alzheimer's disease at 25, unless you have a very rare mutation. And if you had that mutation, everybody in your family would have died of Alzheimer's disease in their 20s and 25s. So very unlikely. Okay. Um, can you explain or elaborate on the concept of proactive semantic interference? Why is it called interference? Okay, great. Great question. The reason why it's called proactive interference is remember, you're learning a list of 15 semantically related um, items, right? You're learning the list, you're getting it all down, you're storing it in your memory. What happens is because you're using cues to help people learn the list, 
and cues to help them to recall items, when you actually give another list using those same cues, it activates traces of memory from the first list. So that interferes, that interferes with the acquisition of new learning. So you recall less of the new list and you actually generate intrusions because many people can't inhibit the responses from the first list. So that is why it is called semantic interference because the semantic cues are actually helping the old list to interfere with new learning. Okay. The next two questions are related to possible prevention. So is there evidence around the amount of sleep um, being a positive relationship to getting to delaying Alzheimer's, getting less Alzheimer's? That's a great question. And then the second one is, can one controlled amyloid deposit by diet? Okay, so with regards to the first question, uh, there is no question that sleep hygiene is very important in Alzheimer's disease prevention. Why? Because just like you have the lymphatic system in your body, you know, the lymph clearing out toxins, guess what happens when you sleep? You have the lymphatic system. Actually, abnormal amyloid is carried away. Brain toxins are carried away when you sleep. So good sleep hygiene more and more we're starting to find out that your brain clears toxic things when you get sufficient number hours of sleep. So that's very important. In terms of diet, there is no causal evidence, but there are some epidemiological studies that are very uh, helpful. People who tend to have a Mediterranean diet, a diet that basically is uh, low on the sugars, low in the saturated fat, more emphasizing monosaturated fat. In most epidemiological studies, those people seem to have a lower prevalence of dementia. So when I work with patients and they ask me for advice, I say, uh, well, the American Heart Association guidelines for exercise, make sure you get good, uh, under the supervision of your physician, you get, you get good aerobic exercise, and also, you can do strength training as well in addition to that. Number two, eat something like a Mediterranean diet. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. And by the way, if you have uncontrolled hypertension or you have vascular risk factors, guess what? That can increase your risk for getting concurrent Alzheimer's disease. So what's good for the heart, eating, sleeping, keeping your cardiovascular risk factors low, those epidemiologically seem to decrease your risk of Alzheimer's disease, and I, and I recommend that to all my patients. Okay. The next question is on the availability of affordable testing. Um, I just wanted you to like, go over that little part again that you mentioned earlier, the availability of affordable um, diagnostic testing. Right. So our concern is when people go to a neuropsychologist, they often get a battery of three, and, three to three and a half hours of testing and it's very expensive, it's very taxing on the individual. We like tests like the last two because number one, it takes 12 to 15 minutes to administer depending on how many scales you wanna use. So number one, it's economical. Number two, we can teach a, a high school student to administer it, it's very easy to administer. Number three, we can actually uh, pretty soon with our uh, LASTI BC, which is the computerized version, can actually administer it on the World Wide Web. So just think about a doctor who somebody comes in for a memory complaint and all of a sudden they can sit you in front of a computer, you can work with the computer and they, they can have a printout as to what your risk factors are. So uh, that shows the tremendous utility and we need to get things that are more cost effective. Now, the problem is people are just doing things like an MMSE, a mini mental state examination. That or a MOCA, that is not enough to detect early mild cognitive impairment. It just isn't. It's, the data are not there. But people in primary care want to give these brief tests because they don't have time. So hopefully this will allow people to do screening and to lessen te testing time. Okay. The next question is about correlation of offsprings of late on onset Alzheimer's um, disease. Is there a difference 
whether their mother or father had it, and is there a difference if they're themselves male or female? Okay, so you know we have a small end right now, so it's a great question. So it doesn't seem um, it doesn't seem right now that we have enough data to show whether maternal or paternal transmission makes a difference, or that males being males or females make a difference. What does make a difference is if you have apolipoprotein 4, an E4 allele. So if you have an E4 allele from your parents, um, you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. If you have two 4 alleles, you're even at incre more increased risk. Um, two E4 alleles is about 16 times the risk. Now, 16 times the risk, I've had I've followed people with two E4 alleles who've lived the rest of their lives happily. So remember, statistics that do not speak to an individual, but um, it's really the E4 allele and the genetics that are going to give us some more answers, probably than the paternal versus the maternal transmission. Okay. Our next one is, does Alzheimer's effect have more of an effect on short-term memory or long-term memory? Excellent. Alzheimer's disease has its biggest effects on short-term memory because the hippocampus and the anorhinal cortex are responsible for storing and consolidating short-term memories. That's why people who have mild Alzheimer's disease and even moderate Alzheimer's disease, they can sing a song of a Broadway show that they know. They can remember, uh, I had a patient with Alzheimer's disease who could not remember things from one minute to the next, but when she was taken down to uh, participate in a, a musical songs on the piano, she knew every word to every song. So long-term memories are generally intact until the later stages of Alzheimer's. Okay. Next, we've gotten a series of questions asking about um, the correlations between schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, or other intellectually um, intellectual disabilities such as Down syndrome. So can you talk? I know they're all very different. But they're, how? they're all very different. So let's start with Down syndrome. With Down syndrome. People with uh, Down syndrome actually have, uh, be because of the chromosome that Downs is, is uh, their chromosome is actually related to um, amyloid and abnormal amyloid deposition. So people with Down syndrome are at increased risk for getting memory impairment in their 40s, 50s, and beyond. Much more increased risk. Down syndrome because of the 21st chromosome being affected. In terms of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, I, I finished a chapter on that with my colleague, Dr. Curiel, about a year ago. Uh, there is a lot of debate. I do not see any compelling evidence at this point that having bipolar disorder or schizophrenia puts you at any higher risk for having Alzheimer's disease. The data just isn't there at this point. All right. That is the last question as of right now, unless one pops up in the next minute. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Like I mentioned at the start of the call, this uh, presentation is available for continuing education credits. To get those credits, please complete the survey that will pop up as soon as this presentation ends or the survey that will be sent out in the follow-up email. You do not have to do both. If for whatever reason you don't receive that survey, either through email or by pop-up, simply email me, Etta Rodriguez, and I will send you a link to it. Um, additionally, we will be featuring a Florida Department of Health researcher next month, and she will be presenting in Tallahassee at Central Office, so I encourage anybody to join us in person. More details will be sent out about room location or to join us once again by webinar. And we're so happy to have Dr. Lowenstein here today um, sharing his important work and also highlighting uh, Alzheimer's during National Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.